All right, so once again, open your Bibles to Luke chapter 10. So this is a pretty familiar passage. We, we read a very similar story in Matthew where the rich man comes to Jesus and asks, Rabbi, how can I achieve eternal life? Well, in this case, in Luke's gospel, it's a lawyer that asks this. He says, teacher, Rabbi, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? Now, I think that's an important question. How do you read it? Because it does imply that there's more than one way to read the law. And for some people, that's just, that's blasphemy right there. There's only one right way to read the law. Well, in that case, why did Jesus ask this question of a lawyer? <clears throat> but the lawyer answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. Now this is the Shema. It is a passage so central to Jewish faith that it is read every day. And in modern times, it's read three times a day. It is recited as a prayer. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with your every breath and all your heart. The second thing he says is from Leviticus chapter 19. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And Leviticus 19 says this in the context of you should not hold a grudge or take revenge, but love your neighbor as yourself. And I think that the lawyer is thinking about that clause. He's thinking of the context. And that's not a bad thing to do with scripture. We do it all the time. We try and get as much context as we can. Jesus says to him, you have given the right answer. Do this, and you will live. This immediately reminded me of Deuteronomy chapter 5, that where it says that, uh, that the sins of the parents will be punished to the third and fourth generation. And I think a lot of churches stop there just to scare you, because... They don't go on to the next verse. I hate that it breaks it into two verses. The next verse says, but the Lord will bless to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commandments. That's eternal life. When it says, love the Lord your God, love your neighbor as yourself, that's eternal life. God will bless you to a thousand generations. Now, I don't have any kids. I'm not going to leave behind a thousand generations. But I'm going to leave behind some ideas, aren't I? And if I've lived this passage, if I've loved the Lord my God, then I know that the things that I'm putting out there in the world, those, that breath and that heart, those will continue to exist. Now, in anthropology, a generation is considered to be 25 years, because that's a helpful average. Well, 25 times 1,000, that's uh, more than human history. <laughs> that's more than all of written history. So I want you to know God isn't done loving people, because we haven't even had a 1,000 generations since this commandment was written. This is one of the oldest commandments. But wanting to vindicate himself, the lawyer asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and took off, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road. And I want you to notice, they're going from Jerusalem. 
they're going down the road. One does not go down to Jerusalem. One only ever goes up to Jerusalem. So every person going down the road is leaving Jerusalem headed towards Jericho. That's important because some people say, well, the priest probably didn't stop because he was on his way to Jerusalem. And he had business there. And if he were unclean, he wouldn't be able to go to the temple. Because this man was half dead, he could have been completely dead. And if the priest had touched a corpse, he would be unclean and therefore couldn't go do his job at the temple. Well, even if that were true, and it's not, because that's not how uncleanness works, but even if it were true, it says the priest was going down the road, which means he was going from Jerusalem to Jericho. He wasn't on his way to Jerusalem. <clears throat> He had no reason not to stop. And even so, the entire book of Tobit is written about a man who cannot conscience leaving corpses in the street. His fellow Jews were being beaten and left for dead or killed by the Babylonians, and they were being, their corpses were being displayed horrifically as a warning to the others, and he would go and take them down and bury them. And he spent every night doing this. And the book of Tobit tells how exhausted he was because the Babylonians had persecuted the Jews so horrifically, but he could not conscience leaving a single person in the street for even one night. So no, a priest cannot leave someone on the side of the road half dead or fully dead. They just can't. Now by chance the priest was going down the road and when he saw him, he passed on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came upon him. And when he saw him, he was moved with compassion. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, treating them with olive oil and wine. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will pay you whatever more you spend. In this passage, the Samaritan is not someone who has any business going to Jerusalem. Samaritans don't worship in Jerusalem. He's not going to the temple. They don't live anywhere near Jerusalem. So why is he leaving Jerusalem? It's not for any religious reason. He might be a merchant. He might be someone who has business on the road. But the other two, they're very religious men. Levites are those who are of the priestly tribe, but they're not priests. They don't work in the temple. They work out among the people. So they're the leaders of the synagogues. They're uh, priestly types. But these two don't have any compassion. They may be keeping to the letter of the law, but they have no compassion. Then the Samaritan has no religious reason to do anything. His people have been persecuted by the, uh, by the Judeans, the people of the tribe of Judah, for a long time. But he sees this person and has compassion and goes to great expense. Oil and wine are not cheap. He uses them to treat this person's wounds. Now, I wonder about the innkeeper as well, because uh, the word for inn just means upper room in Greek. We know that um, there was no room at the inn in Jesus' birth narrative. Well, that also just means upper room. In the Last Supper, Jesus and the disciples meet in an upper room. 
It could be a place that's that they're renting out, but it could also be that this that this Samaritan has taken him to a relative's house. That not only has he burdened himself, but he's burdened his relatives with this person's care. And he's keeping him in a relative's guest room. So there's no end to the personal expense that he's willing to expend for this complete stranger. Now Jesus asks the question, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers. Now, I don't always live up to this. I don't know anyone who does. But I know if we read this and we think, well, how can I limit who my neighbor is? How much do I have to have in common with this person to really consider them my neighbor? The moment we start thinking that way, we're not really loving our neighbor as ourselves. And just like the Shema, where in the very next verse it says, take these words, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with your every breath. Write them on your, on your forehead. Bind them to your hands so that your every thought, your every action, will come from these words, the love of the Lord. If we do that, then how can we not take care of our neighbor? Now, I know a lot of us have, have done exactly this thing. Maybe you've taken in a homeless person before I know plenty of people who have, and it's always a difficult thing, and it almost always comes back to bite you. But as Christians, we have to put ourselves out there, even to the point that it hurts. And I wonder, how many times do we have to be hurt? How many times do we have to do this well, I don't know the answer. All I know is, whenever I see someone in need, I have to weigh, can I help this person? Do I really have what it takes to help this person? Or can I even just take them to the next person down the road who's more qualified to help this person? because sometimes we don't have the answers. Sometimes helping that person isn't the best thing for me to do. But I can take them to someone who knows what they're doing. I can get them in touch with someone who can help. A lot of people have this idea that the church is about, um, is about charity and is about your mental health and is about your psychological well-being. And I want you to know that the church may be about charity, but we're not doctors here. What we can do is put ourselves out there to get you the help you need, even if we ourselves can't help. And that's, if we're going to limit it, like the lawyer wants to do, that's how we can still be a neighbor. But I want you to know too that us being a neighbor, that is us being Jesus in the world because the spirit is in each and every one of us. But that's the only place God's spirit is. So if we don't go and help our neighbors, where are the miracles going to be? Where are God's good works going to be? Does God move without us? In every instance where we see God moving and performing miracles without some human agent, we see it as a kind of apocalypse. That's why Jesus says, if we don't praise God, the rocks will cry out in our place. 
In Exodus, we see that no human is willing to help. The people of Israel have lived in slavery for 400 years, and no human being is willing to help. So God moves. And he moves in an apocalyptic way that ruins Egypt. So every time we are God's agents in the world, we are performing miracles, even if it's just as simple as, brother, are you headed my way? I'm headed this way. Can I take you somewhere? Even if that's all it is. So, that's my point. God's miracles are small and simple, and we perform them every day if we're lucky.